First up, we have uh, Senator Malcolm Rod Roberts, a federal senator and member of Pauline Hanson's One Nation Party, representing Queensland. He has a Bachelor of Engineering with Honours from the University of Queensland and a Masters of Business, Business Administration from the University of Chicago. Before entering, uh, before he was elected to federal parliament, he was a full-time political activist and spokesman for the Galileo movement, where he led an ultimately victorious fight against the carbon tax. Since his election, he's been an outspoken critic of big government and the high tax burden that uh, we pay that, that feeds it. Uh, in his maiden speech in Parliament, Senator Roberts warned us that government is a beast that only wants to, con wants to control our lives, where instead its purpose should be to protect life, protect property and protect freedom. Uh, to that I say bravo and please make him feel welcome. So I was told we'd be talking for about uh, anywhere from five to 15 minutes. So I'm going to try and make sure I'm around about five minutes, put a timer on. Um, first of all, I want to express my thanks for the um, Friedman uh, Conference. I came from the University of Chicago as a student there, an MBA at uh, Milton Friedman School, and I very much appreciate his message. But actually, I appreciate being a human more than anything else. I am very, very pro-human. I love everyone in this room because we share that common humanity. What I've been asked to talk about is trends, is trends in politics. Now, I'm only a new boy, so I don't know about too many trends. The people who'll be following me know much more. I'd like to discuss trends we're seeing and trends we're creating, and maybe invite you to join in some of those trends. Eight data points are needed to confirm a trend statistically. Now, some of these trends I'm about to mention, I haven't got eight data points. But Corey Bernardi in Brisbane a few weeks ago said to me, in front of a whole group of people, he said, that little guy over there has done more damage to the Greens and got them more upset than I have in 10 years. So that's a one data point, so I can't say that's a trend. But the Greens are on the way out. The Greens are on the way out. And the reason why I've been effective with the Greens and why the Liberal Party is now starting to call them out and the National Party is because I use data. That's it. That's the only reason. Plus, I'm passionately pro-human, uh, and the Greens are anti-human. Another trend, uh, Senator McGrath in Queensland, he said that he has to go out and listen to people now. Because we've been saying that, and we're stealing some of his votes. He also said that he is a servant to the people of Queensland. I wonder if that's because I've started all my speeches that way, because that is our job, to serve the people who pay uh, for our salaries. Anthony Chisholm in Queensland, a senator, and Murray Watt, I believe, have started using words like cost-benefit analysis. Can you believe it? Where did they pick that one up? So they're starting to copy us, and we're new boys and new girls. So um, their, their appointments, their, their tactics show that they're already starting to copy us. But I'm not going to take credit for some big trends. Let's have a look at some of the other trends that are underway already. There is increased consciousness, number one, of government as being a damaging force in our country and is the current, and force or control is the currency of the socialist and the dictator. And what we see now is a long history of seven decades of basically socialism in this country. And I've seen that in the states where I've lived and worked for five years over the last 40 years. Government has become a tool for control. Now, all I've done is made notes this morning, so I'm not going to go into any detail on these points, but government has become a tool for control. Many of the people in Parliament have no idea they're actually part of that tool. They're ignorant and they're somewhat weak. They're human. There are a few people in both parties, I believe, that are the actual power brokers behind that control. And that's what's wrong in politics today. But the people are waking up because they are disillusioned with politics and with parliament. The second thing that they're disillusioned with is the falsities of those parliament. John Howard was the first leader of a major political party to espouse an ETS, an emissions trading scheme. Not Kevin Rudd, John Howard. He was the person who brought in an, an uh, RET, renewable energy target. Not Labor Party, John Howard. 
and farmers have been stole, have had their part, property rights stolen. Now, there's nothing more sacrosanct than property rights to a liberal. Isn't that right? Yep. Well, John Howard, to comply with Kyoto, even though he wouldn't sign it, rightly wouldn't sign it, he still said we would comply with Kyoto. And so why he did that was, if he, if he stole the farmer's property rights, because you can either do that by killing industry or stopping clearing of land. So he chose the latter because he knew the stopping of industry would not work with the people of Australia. So he stole the land from the farmers, stole their property rights. And he did that without paying compensation. Now the federal government has to pay compensation if it takes someone's land. But by doing deals with Bob Carr in New South Wales and Peter Beattie in Queensland and passing Native Vegetation Acts, they were able to steal the farmers' property rights. So John Howard, RET, Emissions Trading Scheme, Stealing Property Rights. Then we have Julie Gillard making a promise, no carbon tax. What can we trust? There are three basic appeals to voters, economic self-interest, values, and identity, who we identify with. And if you look, look at it now, the Liberal Party and the Labor Party are engaged in a war over economic self-interest. Give me another $10 in my wage, give me another $10 less in tax. They're just bribes using our money. Economic self-interest is all they appeal to. What is more important to most people is the values of this country and the identity of being an Australian. Regardless of skin colour, regardless of background, we value being Australians. But the tired old parties have just become arbitrators over economic self-interest and bribers, conducting auctions with our money. We've got a media now that's distracted distrusted because of fake news. We've got universities that are now teaching people what to think, not how to think. We don't trust universities any, anymore. One Nation supporters have a very strong moral compass and a very strong work ethic. That's why we pull people from the core of the Labor Party, blue collar workers, and we pull people from the core of the Liberal Party and the small, work, small, small uh, businesses, because it's a return to basics. People understand that without the morals in this country, without the pride in this country, without the values of this country, the whole country goes under. So ideas matter. And the idea that humans, that Australians, everyday voters, have not got the sense to understand about values and identity is wrong. It shows a very poor appreciation of Australians. So some of the trends that I can see are coming, those trends I see already, but some of the trends I can see are coming is that we will have more and more data-based policy and we'll have more and more solutions being allowed to emerge. The facts will be presented, they'll be critiqued. Nothing has ever been critiqued about climate change science in the federal parliament, never. Senator Ian MacDonald, to his credit, gave me credit for being the one to start that last December. 10 years, billions of dollars, no data has ever been debated. Never. But we will see that data because of the mess that's emerging in South Australia and the rest of the country. We will start seeing honesty returning to politics. Um, we've seen Pauline Hanson already that uh, showing things like Rod Cullerton being up before the High Court and people saying to her, well, what's your position on this? And Pauline just said, Normally, a political leader would say, I support my person in politics. What does she say? Let the High Court rule. Let the High Court sort it out. We apologise when we make mistakes. We admit when we don't know things. We compliment people like Darren Hinch for making his own apology on the ABCC. We compliment people like Peter Dutton for enacting Pauline Hanson's policies on immigration because it's important that we are here for Australia not to, not to score points off each other. Third thing that's coming, as I've already alluded to, Senator McGrath has said that we need to listen more. The problem is that when we go out and listen, we can do things about it. When the, when the retired old parties go out to listen, they can't because the power brokers tell them what to do. And do you think the people don't know that? They can sense when you're listening. We know when people are listening. The fourth thing that's going to be coming is that the product sells. We see a revolution in, in uh, manufacturing products being sold these days. Honda does very little advertising, yet it's the third biggest seller in America because its product is the best product. The product will sell, and that's what will happen increasingly with the internet. 
and I think this is the last trend I'm going to mention, we will have more of a positive focus in politics, a very pro-human focus, because I, I, I'll be happy to go into this in detail, but humans are amazing creatures. We have had 70 years, certainly 50 years since the R R Club of Rome running around with the UN, demonising humans. We are starting to realise that humans are marvellous. So what we'll be seeing increasingly is a debate between taxpayers and tax takers, between the voiceless and the elites who control politics or controlled, between the positive and the negative. And everyone here I can guarantee is a very, very positive person. Just by being here, you know that the faith, you know what I'm getting at, the faith that people have in each other in the libertarian movement is strong because you sense it yourself. That's why you're willing to have freedom. You understand that's how we, how we, uh, we, we prosper. And the last one is, it'll no longer be between left and right, it'll be between freedom and control. And here's a challenge to everyone in this room. Sometimes when I scratch a libertarian, I find a control freak underneath. <laughs> that's the same with anyone. Sometimes I scratch a parent and there's a control freak underneath. We all must have the patience to allow solutions to emerge. And that's why free markets really work, because billions of solutions come out of billions of people. Thank you very much. Thank you, Malcolm. Um, our next speaker is uh, an ALS favourite, uh, the Honourable Dr Peter Phelps. Peter is a uh, Liberal Party member of the New South Wales Legislative Council. He received his Bachelor of Arts with honours at the University of Sydney and then later his PhD in Australian History. Since he completed his PhD, he's worked as an advisor to various Liberal Party members until he was elected to the New South Wales Upper House in 2011. Uh, Peter's one of the most principled state parliamentarians the country has, and this was uh, exemplified last year when he resigned as government whip uh, of, the, of the Upper House over some new Liberal Party policy over, over, over ethanol and fuel which he described as an agrarious breach of Liberal Party core values. Um, we do love having Peter here. I noticed on his Wikipedia page under controversies, there's uh, four paragraphs there devoted there, but we thought ha it hasn't been updated in a while, so maybe we've got something to add to it uh, today. Please uh, let me welcome Peter. Thanks very much, everybody. I just want to talk today about four trends which I see in politics, two of which I would consider to be good and two of which I would consider to be bad. Um, the first thing is evidenced by this conference itself. I was here at the first conference and it was a motley crew of less than 100 people um, who gathered in a dingy corner of the RSL, City of Sydney RSL. Um, and now it's grown to a genuine conference of genuine um, size and political clout. Part of that is um, a growth of what I call young libertarians, um, particularly people of my generation and younger, um, Gen Ys. Uh, for an Australian in the mid-1980s at university, which is what I was, uh, conservatism or right politics essentially meant an old style uh, Tory paternalism. Um, the old Menzian ideal of we won't be socialists, but we'll give you everything that you want without actually turning you into socialists or as, without branding ourselves as socialists. It was only with the arrival of um, American trains of thought around that period of time. And I do acknowledge, if, Ma if Maureen's here, the old Australia party, but, but serious um, engagement with libertarian thought only really came about from that time onwards when, uh, especially after the internet came in, you could now um, seek out your own political ideology. You could go to Cato, you could go to Heritage, uh, you could go to AEI, you could go to a whole range of think tanks who have presented ideas of a libertarian or classical liberal agenda, which you simply couldn't get here. With all respect to the IPA and the CIS, who at that stage were still basically run by stodgy old guys uh, within an older model. So the, you, the growth of a libertarian or a classical liberal uh, strain within particularly younger people in Australia, I think is quite encouraging. Uh, and something which I think which will continue into the future. Uh, the, the days of big government, big unions, big business, where you're in a job for life and the stability that that ensured, um, 
is gone. And in its place is a greater reliance on individual self-worth and the ability of individuals to make their own way, which of course is a natural breeding ground for libertarian thought. Second thing which I want to say is that we won. What do I mean by we won? I went to Helen Razor's book launch and uh, I was complaining about political correctness and she said to me, Phelpsy, shut up. You guys have won. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, the neoliberal agenda has won. And I was taken a bit aback by that, but aside from the fact that neoliberalism doesn't exist, it's just a, <laughs> a, a condemnation, a, a neo neologism which was created by the left to condemn anyone of a classical liberal uh, bent. But she is right in the sense that even if you have an, un well, you have an incoming uh, left-wing Labor uh, pr uh, Premier in Western Australia who is talking about um, fiscal reform and balancing budgets. You don't get the grand old Keynesian arguments from the Labor Party these days, or certainly not from the leadership of the Labor Party, that it would be great if we have great nation-building infrastructure projects and we're willing to deficit spend and uh, finance to, to do that. We won. We won on the economic arguments. But there's a whole range of other arguments which the left hasn't given up on that it wants to pursue. Having essentially ceded the economic ground to us, it now finds new battlegrounds on which to fight. Which leads me to my first of, the first of my two bad political trends. And it's encapsulated by this sentence, it's for your own good. It's for your own good. And what you have these days is the same old urge to control masquerading beneath a face of concern. As Mencken said, uh, the urge to save humanity is so often a false front for those who wish to control it. And so, as for those who were here in the previous session, public health now becomes a matter of controlling uh, the lives of people. And especially, and this is particularly noxious about it, there's a, there's a subtle, unspoken, but absolutely clear class-based element to it. All this obesity in Western Sydney, smoking in Western Sydney, um, too much soft drink being consumed by people in Western Sydney, um, childhood obesity in Western Sydney, the lack of, the ratio of fast food outlets to um, uh, grocery stores in Western Sydney. In other words, it's the same old bourgeois left who wanted to control humanity from the time of the great progressive movement of the 1890s when uh, you know, polite young middle class ladies went around to working class areas saying you shouldn't drink so much and you shouldn't smoke so much uh, and you, know, you should practice birth control, um, ostensibly because they didn't want the lower classes from uh, multiplying and potentially uh, <laughs> voting themselves into power uh, and thereby losing their own power through this horrible new democratisation of society. But it's that same ethos which continues and has continued for the, to the present day. And once upon a time, the Australian polity would have said, oh, you're all a bunch of stupid wowsers and would have laughed at them. But these days, with the aura of credibility of public health, uh, we're returning to a situation where uh, we have effectively a desire for a return to sumptuary laws. And the first sumptuary laws I could find were Edward I. Edward I sumptuary laws, because Edward was very concerned that the lower classes were wearing clothes which were inappropriate for their status and eating food which was inappropriate for their status and used the parliament to create a law which said if you're of a certain class or a certain status in English society, there were certain things which you could eat and you couldn't eat. There were certain clothes that you could wear and you could not wear. Well, that's what we're seeing, I fear, in a return, uh, a return to those sorts of sumptuary laws in the 21st century. All done under the basis that it's for your own good that you don't smoke as much. It's for your own good that you don't drink as much. It's for your own good that you don't eat fatty foods. It's for your own good that you don't have sugary drinks. It's for your own good. Because you don't know your own mind, but we, the experts, are here to help you and to save you from yourself. The final thing I want to talk about is uh, the nature of political argumentation in contemporary society. And I know 
it's, it's a trope, but I'm actually going to quote from Ayn Rand. <laughs> Chapter 14 of her wonderful book, Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal. And Rand makes this point. In any conflict between two people or two groups who hold the same basic principles, it is the more consistent one who wins. Two, in any collaboration between two people or two groups who hold different basic principles, it is the more evil or irrational one who wins. When, and three, when opposite basic principles are clearly and openly defined, it works to the advantage of the rational side when they are not clearly defined, but are hidden or evaded, it works to the advantage of the irrational side. Well, there's a whole series of what might be called progressive left agendas and arguments which are being used today where this remains absolutely true. Absolutely true. And the inability, largely, of the right of politics to do that, because the right of politics in this country, unfortunately, has too often been a visceral, a visceral sort of understanding, an unintellectual understanding of opposition to socialism, but without an alternate narrative to try and take people through to where they actually should be. That's changing, and conferences like this, and um, MANCAL, and a whole range of other liberty-based uh, organisations, as part of a broader liberty agenda, whether it be in you know, one party or another, uh, continues to make inroads. But there's the third bit which makes, it, uh, makes me quite concerned, and that is opposite basic principles are now no longer clearly defined. And they work to the advantage of the irrational. You need look no further than what might be described as the no platforming of speakers um, around the university campuses of the United States. And it even happened here at the University of Sydney, albeit the person who was no platformed was a person who supported sugar taxes in opposition to some academics at Sydney University who rightly are opposed to sugar taxes. Now I think that person was in the wrong, but the failure, the failure of will to actually engage your wrong enemies in an argument is appalling. And for our side to do it, it, which should never happen. Of course, very rarely does our side do that sort of thing because we actually believe we have the arguments to win against those sort of people. No, no, more often than not, you'll find that the progressive left these days believes that not only can they not win the argument, they don't even want to try and argue. And they know they can't argue against it by, um, because of the fact that uh, they don't have uh, the rational resources to argue against our case and to argue for their case. Instead, they have an echo chamber of self-reinforcing virtues and values, and they don't want that <coughs> in any way cha uh, challenged or threatened. Thank you, Peter. <clears throat> Our last speaker uh, of the session is uh, Professor Wolfgang Kasper. Wolfgang is one of Australia's most treasured economists and is currently an emeritus professor of economics at the University of New South Wales. He was awarded his PhD from Keele University and his distinguished career, which would take the whole, whole afternoon to, to describe even in, in small detail, has included posts at Australian National University, Australian Defence Force Academy, the Reserve Bank of Australia and the Centre for Independent Studies. He has published some 20 monographs and more than 300 articles. Many credit his scholarship and advocacy of market deregulation as a principal driver of the economic reforms of the Hawke Keating and Howard Costello era. Last night, we rightly awarded him with a Lifetime Achievement Award, and it gives me great pleasure to invite him to the stage to talk to us today. Thank you very much for the introduction and inviting me to this good-looking conference. I'm an economist. I worked in about a dozen countries around the world as a consultant, as a lecturer, etc. And now I stand before you as a man in the prime of his senility. <laughs> and as it 
as behooves my age and my international orientation, I want to place what I have to say in an international long-term context. When we are talking about prosperity and economic well-being, we should focus, in my opinion, on the long-term, regular, sustained performance as to productivity and per capita income in real terms that is eliminating inflation. And we should ask which countries, which societies have managed a consistently high level of income and uh, equity for people who are prepared to work. Now, um, to get a bit of a feel for that, I engaged in a lighthearted statistical exercise. Looking back to the year 1850 to now, every 25 years, asking who were the gold medal winners, <coughs> etc., in uh, uh, reaching relatively high uh, per capita incomes, and who maintained that level. Now, that long-term marathon uh, amongst the wealth producers has given me results that I would describe as gold, silver, and bronze medals in the Economic Growth Olympics. The winner in it is Switzerland, most consistently, most wealthy, most productive, and having lived there and partly being educated there, most civilized. Second silver medalist is the United States, and the bronze medal goes to Australia. That may surprise you. And then there are place getters, just to mention them, the Netherlands, Canada, and in an earlier age, but rapidly falling out of medal contention, the United Kingdom. Now, with regard to uh, the Australian result, which surprised me and uh, friends with whom I talked about it, it is not so surprising after all. Just the most recent uh, quarter century is quite remarkable in that as of April 2017, we are the world record holder in economic expansion without a technical recession, uninterrupted. Just uh, now we surpassed the Netherlands. Have we celebrated this fact? No, we are grumpy, we're insecure, we feel miserable. Indeed, the ultimo negativist next door in the ABC tried to destroy, demolish the st statistical evidence because it's evidently politically incorrect to feel good. Have the politicians celebrated that achievement? And it is an achievement. Oh, no, of course, they are too busy uh, with uh, controversies of the day-to-day -day kind, counterproductive point scoring. And what I just said about Australia not having had a recession is quite important to the long-term growth record because differences in long-term economic growth are mostly made on the way down. If you avoid shrinking long, deep recessions, you are out of middle, con uh, you're, not, you're in middle contentions. And if you have distribution fights that make for long extended recessions, you are out of middle contention. Now, back to that middle table. Can we learn something from this evidence? Indeed, I think we can. First, if you look at the big international comparison, all the countries in my list rate economic freedom relatively highly, whether it's measured more recently uh, by Cato or the uh, Heritage Foundation or before uh, on a loser measurement. Depending on good rules that prevent these distribution fights is absolutely essential. Preventing corruption prevents these shrinkages that then throw you back in the foot race. Second uh, common thing is that all these countries have a tradition of self-reliant individualism. Again, that may surprise you when you look critically at Australia only, but you look at other countries further afield and you will see that there is still, from the 19th century, a rugged individualism in this country. And reflecting this, all the countries on my list 
are self-reliant, uh, are stable democracies. All except the United Kingdom have a strong <coughs> tradition of federal or quasi-federal rivalry between states or provinces, coming more or less close to the description of competitive federalism. And I think that's a very important source, not only because I'm Swiss influenced on that one. All these countries have been open to international trade, have attracted capital enterprises and ideas from elsewhere in the world, often with low taxes, competitive taxes, and often have at the same time exported these production factors to other countries. Openness is uh, absolutely essential to long-term prosperity. But there are, of course, important differences between these various countries. The likes of Switzerland and Holland have relied on skills and innovative and commercial prowess. And I speak here of skills, not of education, there's a difference. I want more TAFE, less of these fake universities that don't even know what civil Western civilization is about. The non-European countries uh, in my list have relied more on tapping natural resources, on attracting immigrants and integrating them, absorbing them into the shared culture that uh, forms the intellectual and institutional capital of a country. But tapping natural resources, land, minerals, water, sunshine, etc., also requires high skills. Observers who tell us Australia just digs up dirt and ships it are wrong. They don't know the first thing about mining. And Australia's long-term strength in agricultural production, again, is testimony to the cultivation of long-term skills and enterprise to overcome a secular downward trend in the terms of trade, that is, falling prices and uh, stable or rising uh, input costs. So I would say the bronze medal for Australia is properly earned. Let me pause a bit uh, here and emphasize that what I'm talking about is sustained levels of high income, not the growth rate, which is the normal thing in uh, policy discussion. If amongst the countries that I have selected, uh, the growth rate were the criterion, Taiwan would come out tops. It has now surpassed Japan in per capita incomes. And if we have a shorter time horizon, it would be and a regional perspective, it would be Shenzhen in southern China, a free enterprise zone from 1980 to 2016, real GDP grew by 22% per annum. Go there if you want economic education. And uh, I only mentioned Taiwan and Shenzhen and places like that in, uh, because the middle table may well soon change. If we rest on our laurels, for example, if we adopt the Green Party four-day work week, we'll drop out from good. Uh, of course, it's every uh, newspaper article writes about the China demand flattening off for raw materials. That's true, and that will probably uh, be a future trend, and India won't uh, fill that gap. So we have, I would suggest, an obligation to look more at a Swiss-type benchmark more know-how intensive, more service-oriented uh, uh, development. Service industries are dominating and will dominate uh, the future. And service production depends on good rules, on what we call institutions. And that means in practice more economic freedom, smaller government, more self-responsibility, less uh, visible hand redistribution through regulatory and fiscal means. Ideas for the service industry, more than probably manufacturing, do matter. I agree with uh, what Malcolm Roberts said. Prosperity starts in the people's mind, between the ears. I think uh, we would be well advised to really switch the public discussion about a long-term growth uh, strategy and get away from this bickering tactics about third order political issues. We do have in this country long-term shared interests. I tell that to these guys and question our in parliament. 
And we should uh, reject ministers who uh, say, oh, I'm here from the government, I'm here to help you. <laughs> uh, <coughs> If I, I, I despair when I see someone go to South Australia, talks to people who have a tradition of making corrugated iron, and say, from now on you will produce high tensile steel, anti-magnetic steel uh, for French submarines. <laughs> it ain't like that. You have to start a totally new industry to do that. I also despair when I see handouts being given to states that try single-handedly to save the planet and undermine our most important single competitive advantage, which is cheap energy. Let's demand, in other words, that politicians act a little bit more like grown-ups and maybe go to school in Switzerland or Holland with a different mindset about politics. But we have to be, uh, let's not be naive, political elites rarely help. Their speciality is spin and wasting resources. They, the easy way out is uh, always to borrow. Let's postpone problems. Uh, we can spend more. But if you think you can ever win a gold medal by borrowing, just uh, look at Greece or Japan. In Australia, we were in a very comfortable position with uh, public debt, uh, and then the Rudd, Swan, Gillard, merry-go-round, without any necessity, in my opinion, pushed us from surplus and a comfortable position down the slippery slope to rapidly increasing debt, in, uh, debt. And the Turnbull Morrison team either seem unwilling or unable to do anything about that. And we are confronted uh, sooner or later with an aging problem which will put new burdens on budgets. There is a potential calamity awaiting at least those who are aged less than 60 years in this room. I think the senility brigade, like myself, will be OK. <laughs> Welfare is the big elephant in the room. If we don't do something dramatic and rethink public health care, risk coverage for unemployment, age, uh, pension superannuation finance, we will be in deep trouble in 20 years' time. Collectively financing that by either tax or more debt is not the way out. I have uh, lately been quite interested again in proposals coming out of New Zealand. Some of you may have seen them by <coughs> Sir Roger Douglas and uh, Robert McCulloch who say, let's re-examine what's happening successfully in Chile and uh, Singapore, where we do compulsory saving for old age, for insurance against health risks, etc. Now, I know the word compulsory doesn't go down very well amongst libertarians, but the alternative is that we postpone the uh, taxing compulsion uh, into the future. And the uh, anarchic uh, solution say, oh, well, the people who haven't provided for themselves, let them die, is probably in Australia not acceptable. Be aware of the political bureaucratic elites who do not favor fiscal discipline. They do not favor economic freedom. They are for more interventionism. And be aware, of course, of the media lackeys who repeat these messages. I recently wrote an article in Policy, which I think is in that uh, 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 bag, where I said that the unrelenting growth of the burden of government that replaces more and more private choices, uh, private sovereignty, by public choices is the key to the ballot box rebellions that have started in all Western democracies. We have to be aware of populism, I believe, but I'm also not terribly terrified by the fact that they stir up things a bit. I agree with uh, what was said earlier. A bit of Trumpism is probably very good for this but this eternal uh, business as usual, I do deals, etc. The other uh, enemies of uh, freedom that we have to watch are the international power brokers that favor collectivism. I think not only of the UN and the OECD, 
not only of these international high tax cartels that go by groups of five, seven, twenty, or whatever, they promote controls over people once removed from the democratic process. Now, the extreme case is, uh, of course, the EU, which is uh, there to strangle national sovereignty, and we know what's happening in the electoral scene there. I believe the only basis for a free democracy to function properly is the nation state. If I'm wrong on that one, <coughs> tell me in the Q&A session afterwards. A UN governed world is no way to go if we want a decent life uh, under freedom. Nations have a shared institutional capital and capital is valuable, institutional capital is productive. <coughs> The rules that we have developed over time, the habits and attitudes that we share, are absolutely essential to long-term growth. <coughs> they are the rules on which uh, trust and peace uh, are uh, based. Now, uh, identity politics has been mentioned a lot here, is the enemy of uh, some of the things I said. If you are first and foremost part of an aggrieved tribe and the politicians will help you, uh, you are on the wrong way and away from uh, prosperity and peace. Let's be very clear about these shared ins institutions that I just uh, mentioned. These have also implications for people movements and here I get into difficulty because uh, immigration in this conference is uh, discussed under different angles and assumptions. My own opinion is this. Australia and all the other countries have benefited from immigration. They are an important source of our prosperity and uh, that source should be kept alive. But immigrants have to integrate. If we if, they, if we get lots of groups in that refuse to integrate for whatever reasons, that have a separate identity, that send signals out that we are being colonized by them, if politicians cater to that identity policy card, it, it, sec, Section 18C, etc., we will end up with a fractious uh, multiculturalism, which is very costly. Chris Burke, who said he wants unlimited open immigration, ought to be taught by Sinclair Davidson a little bit about the transaction costs of a fractured society. <laughs> fractured societies fail. Less liberty, less prosperity, less peace. If we grant open access to people from failed <laughs> states who carry with them attitudes that made their home countries fractious and uh, uh, unsafe, they will carry this into the Australian scene and we have to stand up now by selective immigration and defense, rigorous defense of a secular, tolerant, egalitarian society. Now, the rise of populism, as I said, is probably a pretty good tonic to shake things up a bit. But we have to make sure that the populists stay committed to those basic values that have been the underpinning of the medal winning uh, strategies in the countries that I enumerated. That means individual freedom, equality before the law. If uh, populist uh, possum stirrers like Trump deviate from these principles, we should turn against them but we should not panic blindly. For a bit of an orientation for the younger people, I'd certainly say if you want to know how to think about politics, Milton Friedman, the patron saint of this uh, meeting, would be a good first guide. Also, uh, look at uh, the writings of people like John Locke, Adam Smith, Frederick Bastia, Mises, I could go on. I think it's our citizen responsibility to learn what promotes liberty, prosperity, and peace. It is our democratic responsibility to vote for people who share these basic aspirations, who understand this. 
By the way, I would also say, don't waste too much time on studying Karl Marx, Gramsci, or Piketty. <laughs> Whatever the reviews uh, say, they are not all that interesting. Uh, don't uh, follow the collectivist green profits from Al Gore, the United Nations Environment Program, the Earth Systems Governance Project, Tim Flannery's self-anointed Climate Council, the Australian <laughs> Student Environmental Network. They are the enemies of freedom and future prosperity. Nor are they good for the environment. Poor and stagnant economies have neither the resources nor do they allow the will to do something for a livable environment. Growing countries, rich countries, Switzerland, etc., have pretty good environments, and it costs to maintain a good environment. If you want freedom, prosperity, and peace, treat those guys as pure poison. Now, this is very unlibertarian to a note to end on if I say do not read Marx. But remember one thing, you can try any mushroom in the forest, but some only once. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. We've got the questions rolling in. There's quite a few here. Might start. Uh, with one from James Reid, and this is probably to the whole panel. Do you see Australia following the same trend as in the US and Europe, and at some point pursuing an Australia first policy, and, and there is such a resurgence of, of nationalism that that brings with it? And if you don't mind standing uh, when you do answer the question so we can get you in, in the video. Uh, yes, I do see a, see a, a trend towards Australia first, because uh, it is our country. That number one, as uh, Wolfgang said, we have to bring in people who will fit into our um, culture. And that is, we, we have already started the debate on not just the quantity of immigration, but the quality. And that's something that had to be said, and I've said it a number of times. And how do we define the quality of immigration? By the people's willingness to assimilate and integrate. Uh, sorry, ability and willingness to assimilate and integrate. That is Australia first. When we have the Australian culture first, then everything else follows. And so when we have the Australian culture first, we also have a government that serves Australian values. We also have a government then that serves freedom, which is a part of the Australian culture. So yes, Australia first. Um, I'm not sure what we mean by Australia first, but if it includes the nationalisation, or effective nationalisation of um, gas resources from Queensland because our own state governments were uh, ridiculously misled by green activists uh, who, were, uh, for their political purposes, uh, sought alliance with um, uh, farmers who are ignorant of the actual nature of coal seam gas uh, drilling. Uh, I'm not sure that a return to nationalism of economic resources uh, is that encouraging uh, for our society or for our economy. Um, in terms of uh, the broader issue of um, immigration, uh, everyone makes the, the, the classical error of uh, misconstruing culture with ethnicity. Um, it's far too complex a, uh, an issue to raise in a brief point here, but culture is not ethnicity and ethnicity is not culture. And anyone who believes that the two are interlinked in any way uh, seems to believe that the mere fact that you were passed through your mother's vagina over a certain portion of earth imbues you with certain qualities uh, is completely deluded. <laughs> I think it's one intellectual challenge of our days to think very hard about what is it? What elements constitute Australian values? Are they the same as in some other countries that have been successful? Are they different? Our different factor endowment, etc., our geographic situation may well influence it in a certain way. Uh, I think. Uh, we have to talk more about Western civilization, uh, 
I'm part of that uh, project which has been going on through the IPA. And uh, it's an invitation to the younger generation to really follow up and think hard about it. A sound bite out of Turnbull, I think was it last week, that we have to do values, etc., has to be followed up by long, hard work and thinking and mutual education. And with Turnbull, the sound bite is only <laughs> three days, so I think we want the, the consistency out of the government. Culture is made in the hearts and minds of the people. And uh, a question on regarding re reform from Peter Shepherd is probably to, to you again, uh, Professor Casper. Australians have been rebelling against the heavy hand of the state, at least since the foundation of the country party, C. Hancock. None of these, those rebellions had made much inroad. Reforms tended to be driven from the centre, e.g. the Tariff Board, later becoming the Productivity Commission. What hope is there for reform going forward? You want me to say none? <laughs> oh, no. I totally agree with what we heard. I think there are positive trends. The fact that so many people now meet here. 30 years ago, when I was the possum stirrer from outside, having arrived at not liking certain aspects, I didn't quite share the culture of protectionism at the time. We were a very small group of elderly men. There were no women in that crossroads group that met were not invited. There were a few uh, fringe groups like the Adam Smith Club, but a conference like this one was unimaginable. It's a good sign that it's now happening. And I, I think that trend is growing. If I go around the country and talk to school teachers, younger school teachers, not the middle-aged ones who are bloody minded, but the younger school teachers are possum stirrers. Let's encourage them. Let's talk to them. Give them the raw material to teach new thinking. Uh, if I just add to that, um, if you actually have a look at the makeup of uh, our parliaments uh, over the last 20 years, there's also been a significant rise in classical liberal thought um, in the parliaments. When I first came to this conference, I was the only member of parliament who espoused, well, openly espoused libertarian or classical liberal philosophy. It was even before Clinton Mead was elected the mayor of, um, of, uh, of Campbelltown um, for his glorious term when he sought to reduce uh, rates and suddenly found uh, an amalgam of uh, interests who didn't want rates reduced. Uh, but have a look since that period of time. David's gone into the Senate. Uh, you now have a whole series of new liberals come through. Think of Tim Wilson, James Patterson, um, Within the, the existing political context, there has been a, a slow, slow a bit, but inexorable rise of libertarian and classical liberal thought in individuals across a range of parties. Um, occasionally, they don't always agree with us on a range of issues, but the uh, uh, opportunity for alliances with people on particular issues is, is certainly greater, and I think that's encouraging. It's not merely the fact that 300 people have gathered here, but that that idea, that, that expression of classical liberalism and libertarian thought has now made its way through to both state and federal parliaments. Uh, we touched briefly on the importance of, of, of having uh, cheap, cheap energy and, um, and reforms that would then encourage it. What uh, is seemingly absent from the conversation when we talk about energy in Australia is, is nuclear power. Why, why do we continue to ignore this when we potentially have an enormous amount of reserves, a, a, a blank slate where we can start at least with some sensible regulatory framework to start with? It's, it seems it's a question that's, that's never really spoken about and we just, uh, it's, either, it's either windmills and, and solar panels or it's uh, coal and gas. Why is that? Well, look at me. Um, <laughs> let's go back to some fundamentals. The source of all human progress, all human security and all human comfort is our creativity and our care. That's where it all comes from. Everything in this room has come out of our creativity. And that creativity and that care is inherent in humans and has been proven over the last 10,000 years and it's reproven daily around the world billions of times every day. 
And government's role is not regulation to control, it's governance, creating the environment so billions, yes, billions of people, in our case, 24 million people, can use, freely share their ideas to create prosperity for all. That has been the miracle of the last 170 years. Never before have we had billions, literally billions of people, taken out of the vagaries of nature, nature's extremes, droughts, floods, famines, and now we're safe. We have a cyclone, how many people die? Very, very few. That is because of our care for each other. And that care is expressed through the marketplace. Because if you don't care, you don't have customers. It's really simple stuff. But we have been told the reverse for 70 years by the United Nations, pursuing a political agenda, a global political agenda, and we've been told the reverse for 57 years by the Club of Rome. Humans are evil, greedy, uncaring, irresponsible. Yet we are inherently very caring, very loving. And it annoys the hell out of me to hear this message that humans don't care. So what we need to do is slash regulations and curb government control so that billions of people can freely make, uh, make decisions and automatically have them uh, tallied and totaled and then action. And it's called a marketplace and it's called an election. And I agree that we need to discuss uranium, uh, sorry, nuclear power, but we need to remember that in addition to the creativity and the care that has driven our phenomenal progress in the last 170 years, has been cheap energy. There is only one need, in energy, one, one factor in energy, and that is whether or not it is cheap. And so we need to get and have a discussion about uh, nuclear power, but we need to first of all come back to fundamentals and look at cheap energy. What makes it cheap? That's the criteria. And you can throw into that environmental responsibility. You can throw into that environmental friendliness. You can throw into that reliability. You can throw into that security. You can throw into that stability of supply. It all comes down to cheapness. All of those factors come back to cheapness. And so there is only one reason that I can see why people should be, could be against nuclear power, and that is waste disposal. But we need to look at the discussion, have a discussion on that as to whether or not that can be done cheaply. Because right now I agree with what Wolfgang said, the fundamental driver is cheap energy and human care. And when we care, then life flourishes. And we need to get back to having an honest discussion, and that includes nuclear power. There is no reason why we shouldn't have a discussion. You just mentioned disposal of the radioactive material. Australia has a fantastic absolute advantage in old rock formations out in the desert. We could store the radioactive material of the world for a fee. I think if we wanted to go nuclear, I would start at the tail end, taking uh, the rejects of overseas uh, nuclear energy. Whether we have raw materials in uranium or not is second rate, I think. But of course we have green concerns that pervade every party in this country and in the population. Radiation is terrible. And that's irrational. Getting a few questions for you, Malcolm. You might need to put your One Nation hat on. Um, you, you previously were, were warning us about how you're seeing that socialism kind of creep in in a lot of, a lot of parts of e the US and also our culture. Um, so why are you in a party which favours nationalisation over privatisation if you, if you rightfully highlight the, the, the dangers of socialism? That's really easy. There are, there are some things um, that are best left to government and best left to state government. Now. The federal government has taken over so many aspects of our lives. The federal government should stick with foreign policy, defence, border protection, uh, trade between states, making sure that that is fair. And there's one other one, I can't remember what the other one is. Oh, communications. That's it. And that should be minimal. The rest, our, our constitution, as I've read it, thrives on competitive federalism. And we saw what happened when Joe Bielke Peterson abolished death duties the Gold Coast took off because people went up there to retire. 
And what happens under competitive federalism is that individual states work out how to minimize costs and how to maximize services. So we need that competitive federalism. At the moment, we have got a dog's breast breakfast when it comes to energy, and that's destroying this country. So what we need, when we've got far-flung far, far states, such as Western Australia and Queensland, with small populations by world standards, four million people in Queensland, a size that's, uh, uh, that's covering an area two and a half times the size of Texas, America's biggest state, is that it becomes very difficult for people in Western Queensland to have access to the same services, communications, and electricity as the rest of the country. So when I talked with, when Pauline Hanson asked me to, to stand beside her in the Senate, I said I would think about it and then I would have a talk with her. I had a talk with Pauline for about 12 hours. And when I finished, I was in. She met all of my questions honestly and factually. And what I realized in Pauline is that she is a libertarian more than anything else. That's true, she is. But what happens with, um, with Pauline is that she doesn't do anything just to be an ism or an ian. She's not a capitalist or a socialist or a libertarian. She is above all for Australia. And what I've come to realize is that in a perfect world, it would be a libertarian world. But when we have a banking system the way we have got it, when we have international organisations that are trying to control us, as we have, then we need to come back and actually make modifications for that. So, scratch me, I'm a libertarian, but I'm not a pure libertarian because the real world is not libertarian at the moment. There are too many control freaks running us internationally and in the country. And what we need to do is look at practicality. So if we have an, we have an asset that has been built by the people of Queensland, I'm talking about electricity generation, then it should be left in the hands of people of Queensland and we should be having uh, the people of Queensland <laughs> controlling that asset. Right. We can still have a free market, but we can't have uh, control of our electricity asset in foreign hands. That's fundamental for me. A uh, question probably for, for Wolfgang from, from Rod. In the 80s, we had a left Labor, left Labor government who pursued economic reform, and now it seems the Overton window has shifted so far that we struggle to even convince our right Liberal uh, government that economic reform is important. Do you have an explanation for this? The explanation was probably Whitlam. He's at Cairns. They stuffed up the economy so bad that half a generation later, nothing was possible other than liberalising. If you go deep into socialism, like in China under Mao, you get a move to capitalism. China is now a capitalist country. And I think it's uh, the same now. And the success of these reforms has given rise to a new generation who just don't know how traumatic the experience is with dealing, rent-seeking as usual. I think uh, those people who are the majority in federal parliament I think it's just automatic. Economic growth falls from the trees. No, it doesn't. It is not automatic. If we go fishing again, if we do the four-day uh, work week, we'll be surprised just how quickly we go down the chute. But that realization is not really shared by anyone in any major party. So we need a real <laughs> crisis, don't we? Traumatic learning. <laughs> Well, on that, on that dramatic end, I think we'll call this uh, session closed. Please join with me to thank, thank our three speakers. <laughs>